So welcome to another show. Uh, today we have Larry Campon, who is an author and a podcast host. So welcome to today's show, Larry. Thanks, Jeevan. Thanks for having me on. So you were saying a, a minute ago, just off air, that you've been playing softball today. <laughs> it's always nice to have a hobby that you can really just get away from everything and actually just be in the moment with with that particular sport or activity. Yeah, and we have a big tournament next week, and so today we were just practicing, but uh, yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. I mean, I enjoy it. I have time to do it, as we discussed. Um, I try and stay busy, and it's something that I do about three days a week. Yeah, I mean, I do not softball, but do judo at least three, well, three to six times a week, I would say, and it's, it's something that can really take your mind off some of the um, difficulties that may be going on in your own life, something that you can have a focus on, you can set sort of tasks and objectives within that to get better. And it's a good social thing. You get a sense of achievement as well in terms of, I know you said that you're going to Vegas for competitions. I think that's a really important part of of, of life, really, um, for people to have. So it's good that you're, you're doing that, even at, um, especially, as you said, as well, off air at your age. But you've come from a, a, a background um, where you've, you've, sort of gone the other end of the spectrum in some respects you were obviously raised a mormon uh, as you understand can you talk a little bit about what mormon is uh, ism is and how that sort of gave you your perspective as, as a child essentially sure so technically the church is called the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints most of the time we've been referred to as mormons and referred to ourselves as mormons and I should say I'm no longer Mormon. I'm, we were up until 2017. So we've been out, I don't know, seven years or whatever. But um, as I mentioned, you know, we talked a little bit about my book. In my book, I talk about my upbringing. And of course, a big part of that is, you know, I was in a high demand religion. It wasn't you show up on Sundays and you're done for the week. It was an everyday thing. And when you're part of a high demand religion, um, your, your behaviors are controlled, your information that you receive is controlled, your thoughts are controlled, and your emotions are controlled. So you don't realize when you are in a high demand religion, or maybe some people would even say a cult, but you don't see it when you're involved in it. You only see it once you're out and you're looking back. But uh, growing up, I thought, you know, life was fairly normal because it was all I knew, right? My parents were Mormon, so you are the religion of your parents. And until you question if you ever do then you remain that way so we didn't really question things i guess in finality until 2017 when our daughter came home from college with information that we had never heard about so there's that information right if they lose the control of your information then that's part of the uh now you're going down the rabbit hole well it's with anything if you've got your blinkers on other people can see things and they say, look, you're looking at this in the wrong way. But you're like, no, I'm not, because you've got your blinkers on. But as you said, as soon as you get a piece of new information, it changes your whole perspective. I don't what was the what was the piece of information just out of interest? So the the individual who started uh the Mormon church, and they, they would say he was one who restored the church because they believed that it was the church that Jesus Christ set up when he was here some two thousand years ago. So they believe that Joseph Smith restored the church, and he has a story that he talks about. And in his story, he says, you know, A, B, C, that he did these things. Well, the information that we received was there's about five different accounts of that story, and they go with one that sounds the most palatable today uh, and that makes the most sense to most people. So if somebody's knocking on your door and they're saying, hey, Jeevan, I've got this message here, and, you know, they're going to tell you this message that, I mean, if they told you the real way it went down and all the information, you would just slam the door. A lot of people would slam the door anyway, but uh, much less likely to be receptive to the message. And the information there just talked about things that he did that were very different than what I was taught growing up. For example, and this is a big thing for anybody who was Mormon, they put a lot of emphasis on the fact that Joseph received... Uh, um, a visitation. So it sounds funny when I'm telling it back now that I don't believe this anymore, but again, <laughs> I was in it. So I, I have to give space for that, that the people that still believe it, I can't just laugh at them because I believed it. But he, so he found these, these plates that he was told about in this hill and that he dug them up and that he translated those plates and they were gold plates. 
and that they had been inscribed by prophets who lived in the Americas hundreds of years before. And that's and the, so when he transcribed or translated those plates, that became the Book of Mormon, which is a big, I mean, they believe it goes with the Bible. You know, it's it's a history of the peoples who lived in the Americas, whereas the Bible is a history of the people who lived over in the, you know, Middle East or whatever. So now they changed that. So a few years ago, they said that Joseph Smith put his head into a top hat and there was a rock in there and the words appeared on the rock. So why, why then would he need the gold plates? Right? So, I mean, they kind of box themselves into a corner because for a hundred years or more, they said that it was gold plates that he translated into the book of Mormon. And now they're saying he just stuck his head in a hat. So why did he need the gold plates? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. So that was a big thing. And I know for some, that might seem like a small thing, but if your testimony was that Joseph Smith really was a prophet, that he really did the things he said he did, and then you find out otherwise, well, then it kind of all just crumbles. It's like that Jenga game, right? You pull out the one piece and it all crumbles down. Yeah, well, exactly. And I think, so, so you guys believe in the Bible in, uh, ultimately as well? Or, again, we're, we're assuming you're still in that perspective at this point, and then we'll move on, obviously, later. But at that point, yeah. the, Bible is, the Bible is gospel, is it? So the, the, the Mormon... Uh, faith does believe in the King James version of the Bible. Yeah. Okay. I think like, it's really good to have these discussions, especially with, with religion. Um, I would put myself in under uh, philosophical argument. So I'll talk about a few of them. So predominantly religion, especially Christianity and the, the Abrahamic religions are based on what's called a miracles based argument. So the miracles of, Jesus being born by a virgin, you know, walking on water, etc. Um, the burning bush, Ten Commandments, all of these things are predominantly based on miracles. So the whole underlying mm -hmm. underlying faith is that you have to believe in these miracles to then be able to believe in the other side. Now, actually, as far as behaving correctly, there's loads of good stuff in the Bible, especially the book of Proverbs about behaving correctly and how you should fundamentally behave that is going to be or, or, or shed you in a good path to be a good human being now that's the fundamental argument of a miracles based argument so that in itself you know if you're going to use that as an argument does that defy logic and give you a fundamental argument the other part is actually is there a god with regards to religion um and there are again many arguments but i think the the most important one is what's called the teleological argument which is essentially what's called a watchmaker argument where if you were to find a watch on the beach you would essentially look at the watch and think that must have it must have been designed because there are structures like a human body. It has arms, it has legs, it has a brain, it has function. So in that respect, I can agree that there is a fundamental creator of the universe, but that and religion doesn't have to be, uh, they, they don't have to be together, essentially. You can, you can believe that something created Earth, but you don't necessarily need to believe that these miracles based parts of a faith are true. And I'm not saying they are and they aren't. This is the whole point of these sort of arguments is, is to give an idea as to what and what's true. Now coming on to your book, for example, which I think is great, um, nobody knows. They just think they do, I think is a title. Um yeah, they just want you to think they do, yep. Yeah. So so with regards to again, sticking with philosophy for the purpose of this, I'm probably gonna go on a two minute rant, but there is three core parts of philosophy. There's uh, ethics, how we should behave. There's um, metaphysics, how we see the universe. And there's epistemology, how do you know what you know, basically? There are two core um, parts of this. is like empiricism, which is sense experience or experiments to see what happens. And then there's rationalism, which is can you rationally deduce what is true? Now, there's something else called fallibil fallibilism, it's a mouthful that is, which I think is actually one of the more true versions of epistemology, which is basically saying, and this is why I'm, I'm basically alluding to this, to, to come back to, to your book, really, is it says that nothing can be seen as true. Because actually, in the past, the word atom means it comes from the, the Greek atomus, which means uncuttable, which was seen as the smallest piece of matter essentially but actually after that they found that the quark is now the smallest or whatever else is going to be the next smallest so actually you're always playing catch up with what you know so how do you know that what we know today is actually true and it's not going to be something else 
Now, there are some things that are called axiomatically true. So, for example, one plus two is one plus one is two. And that will always be the case. There are certain things that will always be the case. So I think the, the, where I'm basically going with this is coming to, to your book, the fallibilism part of, of philosophy in, in respect of how do we know what we know? Are you essentially saying that we don't know anything and not in a in a sceptical or arrogant way? Oh, we don't know anything in a humbling way that actually there is so much to learn. Maybe a little of both, because I do believe that there are plenty of people out there that want you to believe their message is true. And when you talk about epistemology and about miracle-based um, religions and things like that, if I was to come to you, Jeevan, and say, oh, I had a visitation from God yesterday and he told me blah, blah, blah. Well, you can't say I didn't, right? I mean, it's my word. And I mean, but that's how a lot of these religions started whether it's Mormonism, uh, you know, whatever, they started with somebody who said, um, I'm talking to God. And me right there, that's where I'd be a little bit skeptical. <laughs> that's just my personality and my nature. And some might say, well, you need to have faith. You just need to have faith that what I'm saying is true. Yeah, but I take facts over faith. So I have a choice. And um, so, yeah, my title, they just want you to think they do. There's a lot of people out there want you to believe the message they have, whether they're selling an automobile or they're selling a religion. And I think that it's good to be skeptical. I think it's good to ask questions. And if the person talking to you doesn't want you to ask questions or doesn't want you to do any research, then I, I would be leery of that as well. Yeah, I mean, the, th the thing is with the, with the, oh, God told me to do it, it's, it's like a fallacy in itself because if – if God told you to do something good and it happened, it's like, oh, well, well, God told me to do it, right? And I'm not having to go at God because God has got so many um, connotations of what it means. I'm talking in respect of like a, an Abrahamic version of, of, of sure. God, for example. But if people do something bad, it's like, well, if he said God told me to do it, they'd be like, nah, nah, it can't be God. It must have been Satan. So it's like you can pick and choose what parts you think. It's like a... Um, not not straw man fallacy, but it's like you're just picking and choosing which which parts of X, Y, and Z you fits your narrative. I think, as you said earlier, with regards to the gold plates versus the go in the hat, it's like this now fits my narrative better than the previous version of the story. Therefore, I will scrap that. I will input this, and that's going to be more um, digestible for the people that we're trying to you know convert to X, X, Y, and Z. I think Voltaire is is someone who said it quite interestingly. He said something along the lines of God doesn't really care actually about these sorts of things because, and again, I'm not saying I agree. These are just things that I think about and how you can navigate these sort of questions. He basically said, imagine the King of Egypt, he's got a boat and that's a King of Egypt's God and the boat is, is the earth or whatever. And all he cares about is getting it from A to B that, you know, that's his, his job. He, he's in control of the boat. We are like the rats at the bottom of the boat in, in the sort of, uh, the uh, the excrement or whatever you want to call it at the bottom and it's up to us actually to get ourselves out of that shit is you know it's not the gosman's not going to you know pull his finger out and, and and start changing things actually we need to go through bad things in our life to actually develop and like if you've got a kid you don't just give them every um every sweet every chocolate because actually they need to grow up and not be spoiled for, for example so i think that like instead of um you know um a religious that's just like oh you must do this you must do that there's something called pan uh, panentheistic views, which is like God is just nature and that he runs a structure and actually it's up to us to be part of that in a, in a good way. So coming back to, to the book and, and nobody knows, so what is it that you go into in that book that is at the forefront of what the book is trying to deliver in terms of a message? Well, the message is just really my take on life. So I've got about 20 five, six chapters in there. Um, and because books today can be what we call print on demand, you know, it used to be if you were going to write a book, you'd have to buy like a thousand books or whatever, or sometimes store them in your garage or whatever. And now when somebody goes on, you know, if they go on Amazon and order a copy of my book, it gets printed then. The good thing of that is as an author, you can go in and update your book write an additional chapter, do whatever you want and change it out if you want. And five years ago, I did that because I had a son, my middle child, 
and he had a ruptured aortic artery. I say aortic, basically it's the iliac artery that comes up through your groin and into your abdomen. So not the aortic artery, but the iliac artery, it ruptured and he died just within an hour, 31 years old. Now, when I was a Mormon, um, I'm doing air quotes there, but when I was a Mormon, we had all the answers. We knew where we went once we died. We knew that we were going to see our loved ones again. We were no longer Mormon. We had left the Mormon faith a year and a half previous. So now when my son passed away, I was like, huh, now what? Well, Jeevan, I'll, I'll be honest. I, I don't have the answers. I'm hopeful. And that's what I tell people. I hope I'll see my son again. I hope I'll see my brother who passed away when he was 28. I hope I'll see my parents. But I'm okay not knowing or not even believing that I know. I'm okay with that. So this book is really just my ideas on different subjects. And my wife th said it so well in the very beginning of the book. Um, I'm just going to, I'm just going to read you this cause it's like one little paragraph, but I said, um, she said, so what's your book about? I said, Oh, I told her it's a short story of chapters on what I thought about life. She said, what makes you think people care what you think about life? <laughs> <laughs> and she had a pretty good point. So yeah, it's it's not like my opinion matters that much. I'm just one guy with opinions, right? I mean, that's why we do podcasts. That's why we write books. That's why I went into sports broadcasting. I think it's because I, I like to give my opinion. I like to tell people what I think. But at the end of the day, I, I am a people person. I'm a positive guy. I'm a glass half full guy. And I, I just like people. And so even though I'm not part of any organized religion any longer, I still believe in being a good person and that if there is a God, you remember Albert Kymus, you might know that name. He was a philosopher and he said, um, Albert Camus. Yeah. The, the guy from France. Yeah. Yeah. Albert Camus. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I probably said his name wrong, but yeah. So he, he said, I would rather, um, I would rather die. I would live. I'd rather live my life and die and find out there is no God then live my life as if there is no God and die and find out there is. And so what I take away from that, Jeevan, is just that he's just saying, I'm going to be a good person. I'm going to be helpful to my fellow man and you know maybe be a humanist, maybe just be somebody who is somebody that people like to be around because you're fun and you're enjoyable, but you're not trying to push anything on them either. Yeah, it's, it's like, um, and this is something I think that the, the, the face, the sales face do, they do um, what's called Pascal's wager, uh, Blaise Pascal. He basically said, uh, either you do, you believe in God and you act in a way that, you know, God sees as fit. And actually, when you die, then at least you go to heaven or whatever. But if you don't believe in God, how much different is your life going to be? You might be a bit more hedonistic. You might be this, that, or the other. But actually, you're going to go to heaven, hell for what, an extra 2% more enjoyment in your life, basically. So he's saying, actually, mathematically, it's in your best interests to believe in God. That's the, the Blaise Pascal um, argument, Pascal's wager. Um, obviously, he's a mm -hmm. mathematician, he's very smart. He created, you know, the Pascal's triangle thing. Um, yeah. I think he invented the calculator as well. Very, very smart man. Going back to just what you said a, a second ago as well, with the life after death, the thing is, for me, everyone wants to cling on to stuff. We, as, as humans get upset when things change. Heraclitus talks about this, like you can't step into the same river twice because you're neither the same man or the same river. And we, we don't like things changing. We like to cling on to stuff. But I've got a different view of this. Instead of being like sad that things are over, be glad that it hap it, they happened. Like you're going to have a dog and you're going to love living with this dog and it's going to die at age 10, 15, whatever it's going to be. And you're going to be really upset. But... Don't be sad that it's over. Be happy that you enjoyed that period of time with the animal. Because before exactly. you had the animal, you you didn't have the animal anyway. And obviously now you're upset, but that sadness is equivalent because everything's got its equal opposites. Because you've had that many years of love and whatever, you're going to have to have some negative with it because yin-yang, you know, you can't have everything mm -hmm. positive all the time. And I think this is something that people don't really get. They're like, well, God, why is there so much suffering? Why is, you know, I've not got exactly what I'm, I'm after? It does not work like that. That's a spoiled mentality. Everything needs to be, if I want to win the lottery, I should win the lottery. It's like Bruce Almighty. I don't know if you've seen Bruce Almighty, the film with um, Jim Carrey. Yeah. And he's 
you know, doing the emails and he just says yes to everyone and everyone wins a lottery and then carnage ensues because you can't give everyone what they want all the time. It's It, it just cannot happen. Um, and this is, again, something that I think people don't really understand, whether it's religious or whether it's through life. They need to have a perspective of, and I mean, you spoke about this um, on, on obviously your um on your page and off air and, and even now the things that you've gone through have, have made you who you are taking the blinkers off and seeing things with this new bit of information you can now change the trajectory of your life and actually can you then keep consuming information that is likely to open up your perspective i think that people um i think most people like learning Although, like you say, some people get really, you know, they don't like change, but so it's learning change. I guess it could be, right? If you're learning about something that you believed wholeheartedly in, and then you learn, what? I was wrong. So that that can really bother people. And I've known people that have found out the truth about Mormonism and yet remained because they're comfortable there. Back to what you were saying about change. People don't like change, but I've always been one who questions things. I'm big on truth. So if I feel like somebody's told me something that's not truthful, then I got a problem with that. Whereas others are like, well, I'll give them a break. You know, they're human. They make mistakes. And it's like, okay. But when it comes to me giving 10% of my income to them, which is one of the <laughs> beliefs, um, yeah, I think you should be a little skeptical sometimes. So yeah, I mean, on that, the this is, uh, I had this conversation with my brother, or I mentioned it in passing. I was like, all these religions, and again, it might sound like I'm shitting my religion, I'm not. I'm just giving an alternative perspective because, as you said, most people are in under this blinker. If you've got these other perspectives, you can then re um, recalibrate, let's say, your 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 thought process. My thought process is, okay, you believe in God, okay, you created this earth and you created the world and, and, and the, the mountains and the rivers, etc. Yet... To, in order to pray to God, you're going to go to a man-made structure. Why not go into the mountains and enjoy the actual nature that was built? I mean, I don't know if that was a stupid thing to say or whatever, but <laughs> does that make sense? Like you're trying to get that connection with with the the creator and the na and nature or whatever. Why go to a man-made structure and sit on a wooden bench? You know, that's that's again, yeah, a, a and not, not just thing. that. Think about all these man-made structures, these temples, these these churches, these synagogues. If we just, like you say, just went out into a peaceful meadow or out to the forest, or we just met as a group at, you know, someone's home or whatever, and we didn't, we took all that money for all those and and helped those in need. So that's that's again a different view. Maybe that's a more humanist view is to help man, your fellow man. But at the end of the day. You know, when when we lost our son, we grieved very very much, and grieving has stages, and and people grieve differently. So I choose to, like you said earlier, um, we have those memories that have been created. If you know, you mentioned the dog having a dog for ten years or fifteen years. Eventually, they're that dog's going to die, but you're happy for the time that you had with that pet and the memories that you created. Same thing with my son. I'm so glad that we had 31 years. I know people who've lost a child that was five years old. So I had 31 years with my son. What I tell people is, hey, take a lot of pictures, take a lot of videos, do fun things together. Don't put off those trips because you never know. You never know with life. And if you have that belief that this could be it, we could just live this one life and whew, there's nothing else, then enjoy life. I mean, get the most out of it. Go on trips. Uh, you know, when you visit other countries and you meet other cultures, you're learning. And that, that goes back to what I said earlier. I like to learn. I like knowledge. And so just even talking, even with you, um, because before we do the podcast, we usually visit for a little bit. Sometimes we visit a little bit after, but it gives me a chance to kind of get to know you a little bit and, and some of the things that are important to you in your life and what you're doing. And I like that because if you like people, then that's not even hard that's not a challenge that's not a burden it's it's actually fun you can learn something for everyone doesn't matter how superior you feel to someone else or you feel that 
you know, you're a, a better individual, they're thick, they're this, they're that. I guarantee there's something that they they can do that you can't. Even if it's as simple as, well, they're more easygoing than you are. They know how to have a laugh, even they they've got nothing, not a pot to piss in, but they can still enjoy laugh, uh, life and have a laugh. And they're easygoing and they're just they just go with the flow. That in itself is a is a admirable, admirable quality in itself. And I think coming back to what you said a minute ago about um uh, how to live. We need to live in, in paradoxically short term. You said about, you know, take photos, go on that trip, take videos. We need to live short term as if we're going to die tomorrow, but learn as if we're going to live forever. I can't remember who the quote is by. I'm writing a book on quotes at the minute, so I can't remember, uh, apologies, who exactly that was by. But they're saying, look, you should live as if you're going to die tomorrow, but learn as if you're going to live forever. And I think that's a really good paradox to try and embody because if you don't do that you're basically going to put stuff off all the time get to 80 90 years old and wish you'd done all those that stuff and actually get there and not know anything because you've not tried to develop you've not tried to challenge your own perspective I, often when i have perspective i actually try and disprove it and look at the opposite end of the argument and say okay well if i believe this what's what's the argument against that why am i why do i think i'm correct you know nobody knows as you said but why do i think my argument is better than their argument. Well, um, we're going to, we, you learn more when you're listening too, right? Yeah. So exactly. sometimes it's good to sit. I, I like people that have differing views. So I, I believe, you know, you can disagree, but don't be disagreeable because those are two different things. And it seems like we live, I mean, people have probably said this forever, but I just say it today. We live in a world where a lot of people, just want to out shout the person next to them. I'll shout louder than you. And so I can get my opinion heard. But like you said, if you, if you can just listen to somebody else's argument and say, well, why are they coming from that perspective? What, why, why are they who they are? What made them that person? What made, gave them that opinion? And sometimes if you take the time and just talk with somebody without really having the answer in mind, but just listen, um, it doesn't mean you're going to be come around to their point of view necessarily, but at least you'll understand where they're coming from. Yeah, I think listening is a massively underrating, underrated skill. And it's not just to to hear, but to listen. It's like, again, a, a quote is, imagine how many people I've uh, I've looked at but never seen. And and mm -hmm. there was a guy who came on the podcast, I can't remember who, which, which guest it was, because I've had obviously loads of guests. He said something along the lines of, there was a six-year-old and a nine-year-old, and the nine-year-old was teaching the six-year-old how to read. Who do you think benefited more from that? You would think that the six-year-old would have benefited from the fact that the nine-year-old was helping the six-year-old. And obviously they've got someone who's much more intelligent than they are and, and learning from them. But actually it was a nine-year-old who benefited most because they're sharing their knowledge, they're teaching. And this is the sort of dichotomy of this. Actually listening, you can learn more than, than speaking. And actually teaching you can learn more than actually learning sometimes because you are understanding that knowledge much better and you're trying to deliver it in a way that is coherent in your own mind that you then have a a, a high level of understanding. It's like, I think it was Isaac Newton said, or Einstein, um, you know, unless you can explain it to a six-year-old, you don't understand it at all. And I think that is um, that is definitely true. It's eternally true, in fact. Yeah, both my parents were educators, school teachers. And so education was real big in our family. And, um, you know, we did public speaking and different things in different positions in life. And so just last weekend, my wife and I were asked to speak at a conference for 30 minutes and we were supposed to speak on thriving. And so for, for the two weeks prior to the day of the speech, I mean, you can only imagine how many times we rehearsed this and got the timing down and got it down so that when we got up and gave the PowerPoint presentation, we had it memorized and we could go, you know, we each had our own microphones. So we'd go back and forth, but we really practiced that. And so, um, and, and I've taught seminars where I've gone to employees and in preparing for that speech to teach them, you learn it a lot better because you have to, you're forced to learn it when you're going to teach it. And that's kind of back to the, your nine-year-old, six-year-old. Yeah. It's amazing to, yeah. Teaching the best way to learn. And yeah, it's, again, this is, thinking outside the box it's not necessarily thinking outside the box but it's this is the 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 
more mainstream way of thinking this is actually how it works and most people are on this side and they're not looking at it from a different side and it's all about actually learning these things and changing your tact um you don't have to even have to work harder you know like with sailing how they uh they tack the um tacking where they use the wind that's going against the boat to actually drive the boat in that direction it's not about working harder it's about working smarter mm-hmm. and that is really where people need to be um in, in order to, to develop um rather than you know hitting their head against the wall and, and hoping you know <laughs> to, to 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 get better essentially so so yeah um so obviously now what any are there any projects other than the books that you're you're working on at the moment or I guess um, I'm always working on my podcast just because it comes out every two weeks. And so, you know how that goes. You, you need to get guests and, and you know, do the podcast, do the editing and all that kind of stuff. I enjoy um, my podcast has a bit of a Hawaiian theme. So I'm really big on Hawaii. We owned a place on the island of Maui for 14 years and I still take care of a condo over there. So I'm always involved. People will call me because they think of me as kind of a Hawaii or Maui expert. And so I get a lot of calls and emails from people. Hey, we're going over to Hawaii. What do you, what are some things we should do? But I enjoy that. If you're, again, if you're a people person, then I don't look at that as like, oh, somebody's using me for information. No, I, I'm happy that they think I know that information and, and I can share it with them because ultimately, you know, when you are doing something for somebody else and they're having fun, then, then I'm having fun. I enjoy it when other people, it's just like when you have your kids and they're small to see the joy, maybe on Christmas morning through their eyes. And it kind of takes you back to when you were a child. And and if that was, a, if that was something you did as a child. So yeah, I, th- I think a lot of times in life, it's, I mean, we have a tendency to be, oh, it's all about me, but I think you get more joy ultimately if you make that all about others. Yeah. Because at yeah. the end, it's, it's going to come back to you anyway. You have to serve others. And again, this is the, the dichotomy. You know, you need to serve others to actually improve your life. You know, whether that's a job, whether that's family or whatever. But actually, to serve others better, you need to work on yourself more to be able to earn more and, and to be able to provide more and be in better health. So it's like, to, to get that better, you need to do this. But to get this better, you need to do that. So it's, again, it's it's, it's a balancing, balancing act. Why Hawaii, by the way? And what, what do you discuss on your podcast? Is it um people's stories or what is it exactly that uh, you discuss and as i said why what was the the draw for hawaii well hawaii i liked since i was a child uh first went there when i was 18 years old and i was fortunate enough i went to college there i uh, ended up buying a place my wife and i did on maui for 14 years and so i just love the culture i love the people i love the aloha spirit love the music so for me it was just a natural fit um I, I I grew up in a religion that didn't believe in reincarnation, but if I was to believe in reincarnation, I would think that at some previous life, I was a Hawaiian. <laughs> That's what I like to tell my wife anyway. She just rolls her eyes, but, but, um, but I like sharing that too. And when you have something that you enjoy, then you want to share it with others. And so for me, my podcast is just somebody coming on and telling their life story. And if they've been to Hawaii, we'll talk about that a little bit. About half the people have been, half of them haven't been. And, uh, and that's fine. And I put a little Hawaiian music in there, but I just enjoy hearing people's stories. And because as we talk, we find, wow, we are a lot more similar than we are dissimilar. And I think that you, you wouldn't know that just walking down the street, but when you sit and have a conversation with somebody for five or 10 minutes, you see, you know, we're not that different. I mean, to be fair, you could probably, I could describe a generic life and most people would fall into um, uh, that, that, you know, they would resonate with it. You could say, you know, you went to school, argue with your siblings, you know, probably had a bit of, you know, shouted up by your parents, got taught to do things that you didn't, or told to do things you didn't want to do, whether that was religion or something else. You know, you grew up and, you you know, you had friends at school that you no longer speak to. You know, you could probably pretty much yeah. do, uh, you know, a life that, and that's not everything that's happened in that life, but that exact thing would have happened at least once at that point in time to that person. And, and and this is it. We, you know, we are going through a um, uh, you know, the human experience as they, as they say, and it's very similar for us all. And that's why you know, reading things or learning things or listening to podcasts and and all of that sort of good stuff, you can develop a perspective from someone who's been through what you've been through to help you navigate 
any storms or any issues that you're having. Like a book that I think is great for everyone to read is Marcus Aurelius's Meditations. Some of the stuff he says in there is just incredible. Um, just as a way to think, you know, be like the the rocks that the waves keep crashing over. Um, basically, the 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 raging of the sea falls still around you. You know, you all this stuff can be going on, but actually, it's not affecting you. Yeah, you know, yeah. Say- yeah, and I and I care about I care about what others think. So when I mean what I'm saying by that is, if you were to tell me, oh, I went and saw this movie, it's awesome, I would take your opinion over something I would read in a magazine or whatever from somebody that's a film critic. So, or if you told me a book to read, like you just mentioned a book there, I would be more likely to go off of one of my friend's takes than somebody I don't know because, you know you know me and you know what I like. And so if you were to say, Oh, Larry, you'd like this movie, then I would take that for, for what it's worth. And and I would value that. So yeah, I, um, uh, I, I just think that, that life is too, it's what you make of it. I mean, we have all these little catchphrases that we use, but it it's really true because at the end of the day, nobody knows if there's something beyond this life. I know people believe, and there's a difference between believing and knowing, at least I think so. And so I'm hopeful, but I don't know. I mean, this could be the only life. So um, as I'm now, uh, I'm in the last, you know, stages of the last 20% of my life or whatever. And so I'm doing things that I enjoy. And, uh, but I believe I've also enjoyed life along the way. I've never been one of those people that says, someday I'm going to do this. I've been doing stuff my whole life. My wife and I have always been physically active. We've all, my wife does triathlons. Um, We're in our 60s now. And, you know, I walk five days a week, over a thousand miles a year. Uh, I've done that for the past 20 plus years. So we stay very active. And the thinking behind that is if we stay healthy and active, we'll be able to do things that we enjoy doing longer. And, it, and it's proving out to be true. But this is it. Again, the, the dark art, people think, oh, well, you need to save your legs, but not, don't do anything because actually you're going to hurt them. But if you were to just sit in a chair... Or put your arm up like there's people who just put their arm up and they lose they lose control of the arm. So you need to keep, continue to be active in order to actually have the longevity rather than trying to save the legs or save you know the the arms or whatever. So I think that's a that's a you know really good point. And the the mental side and the physical side do come together. You know you and that social you, side you mentioned it earlier and that's so true because especially as you get older maybe you retire from your job and this and that and now you're sitting at home you're sedentary you're watching netflix all day i mean you that's not healthy well it's not healthy because you're not being active but it's the mental side of it too the social side that you get usually from a job or from things that you're doing in a career if that goes away then you've got to figure out another way to be socially active as well because that's huge for your mental uh, you know, balance in life. Yeah, they, I mean, they say something like, if you're isolated, it's like smoking 20 cigarettes a day. It's worse for your health than smoking 20 cigarettes a day. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, it's, it's, it is something that obviously needs, does need to be addressed. And even if you are you know, introvert by nature and, you know, you do like your own time, you know, you're a bookworm or whatever it may be, you still do need social time even if it's with the same few people, I mean, it's better to have more, you know, new, new people as well. So you learn some new stuff, but even just a, a circle of people that you, that you, you know, you speak to regularly and you go out and you've got hobbies. And a lot of the time people have different groups of friends for different things. You know, like you said, softball, you might have one for softball, you might have one for you, you know, your drinks down the pub, you know, you might have one for, for your walking buddies. um, And then you might yep. have a couple of um other couples that you and your wife go to dinner with, or, you know, whatever it may be, for example. So, so exactly you, right. Yeah, and this is it. So, you know, you need to have or understand different elements of life and actually like there's a wheel of life, isn't there, with hobbies, finances, family, health, spirituality, etc. And a lot of time you need to actually sit down and, and and rate each of those on one to ten. Because actually what you'll find is your your career and your money is ten out of ten. Amazing. But your social zero, your fitness is and health is zero. Um you, you travel okay you travel is pretty good let's say but you need to have a, a good balance there um otherwise that's where burnout comes from that's where depression or depressive states should i say come from um and it's really about sort of managing that moving forward yeah i read, I read that uh there was this gal that 
worked with uh, people in hospice. They were on the last parts of their life before they passed. And she asked them, what are your regrets? And she said, the thing that people said the most was that they didn't take chances. They didn't, they were comfortable where they were. So they didn't, you know, maybe take that promotion that would have required a move, or maybe they didn't, you know, ask this one girl or guy out that they were attracted to, but just didn't, didn't take that next step. And so when they're at that last stage of life, the thing that they had the most that they wish they could have do, they just had regrets over not taking, you know, opportunities when they were given there because they wanted the security of, you know, just being comfortable. And we went, you know, we talked about that earlier about change. People don't like change a lot of times, but yeah, sometimes change is the best thing that could ever happen for someone. Yeah, I mean, comfort zone is a, is a real dream killer. Um, and you know, if you think about your favorite books or films, the reason that you like them is because you know they get out of the shire, they go and do, you know, they overcome obstacles, they they undertake challenges. And actually, if that's the case, then why are you not willing to do the same thing? So, um, in terms of your book, then and um, your project, where can people reach out to you, Larry, if they if they need to? So my book is on Amazon. Um, my podcast is, you know, everywhere you would listen to podcasts, you know, Apple or Spotify or just pretty much everywhere. And, um, and again, my podcast is just called, uh, nobody knows your story. My book is nobody knows. They just want you to think they do. And if you really wanted to reach out and see everything in one place, you could go to my website, which is nobody knows Larry And I've got my podcast available on there. You could, you could see the episodes there and you can find my book and different things, but but yeah, that's what I'm doing. I'm just, and I'm, you know, really, I'm just a person that's enjoying life and, and enjoying sharing, uh, you know, stories and things with other people. And that's, that's kind of what I'm all about. I just think that if this is it, then I want to make the most of it. And that, when I'm talking about life. Yeah, absolutely. Is there any final uh, words of wisdom or things that you want to say before, uh, before we check out? No, just, just that, I guess, continue to challenge yourself. Remember that sometimes change is good. Learning is good. I love music. I'm learning new kinds of music all the time that I get from sometimes from my kids or whoever. And, you know, cause I, if, if not, I would stay with, you know, my Led Zeppelin and my, you know, Aerosmith and, you know, the rock and roll of my ages, but I'm, I'm listening to new music and I can, I think sometimes again, it's learning, right? Whether it's music, whether it's through books, whether it's through film, I, I like to learn. And so that's all I would say is just, I hope that people will just, no matter what their age or, or whatever, just continue to have a desire to learn and to to move forward. Love it. Thanks for being on the show, Larry. It's been a great, great chat. And thanks, uh, yeah, thanks very much. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it.